Uh, before we kick off our special week of five, count them, five shows. Woohoo! Overtime. I guess so. Yeah, we're getting time and a half for that. It's great until you start doing the math, and then you realize the whole zero thing. Got to say a big thanks to the men and women protecting us in our armed forces. It is Military Appreciation Month, OG. Every month is Military Appreciation Month, right? It certainly is here in the basement. So on, on behalf of not just our team here at Stacking Benjamins, but also the men and women of Navy Federal Credit Union, big shout out to our armed forces. All right, let's crank up the podcast. Here's the song that we'd like to do for all the younger set of people, the teenagers and what have you. This one's called Vacation Zone. From Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and before today, I would have told you there's no way you could actually explore a city with just a single Benjamin in your pocket. No way! I mean, look, back in 92... I blew 300 bucks in Myrtle Beach on ski ball and cherry snow cones alone. That was a totally lit day, by the way, but there's no way in today's day and age you could do a whole city on a hundred. What? There's no way. Oh, you, you can? A hundred bucks. A whole city? All right. Well, it seems unlikely to me, but apparently today we'll talk to a guy who's done it. We welcome the host of George Goes Everywhere from Million Stories, George Igo. Plus, what headlines did we miss while we were away last week? Oh, only Dogecoin, Bill and Melinda, Yahoo and AOL, and probably a ton of other stuff. But, you know, who's counting? Well, we are, and we'll backfill those stories and more during our headline segment. Later, we'll toss out the Haven Lifeline to Bill, and I'll share some of my amazing trivia. And now, one guy who spends over a hundred bucks at the board game store, and the other who can't find a steak for less than a hundred bucks, much less explore a whole city. It's Joe and O J J J J G. And that's specifically why I don't go in board game stores. Welcome to another. Eight weeks of the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe Saul Cihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter, and kicking it off across the card table from me, Mr. OG is here as well. Sometimes it feels like when we have the time off that it's really not actually time off. <laughs> it's almost like it gives us an opportunity to catch back up. Yeah, well, and of course, this particular week, we said, hey, oh, we'll prep for five shows instead of three. Let's do it. Big week this week. It's going to be so fun. We have a special show tomorrow uh, that's part of the Dell Technologies Small Business Podference, they're calling it. Not just us, but an all-star cast, they're calling it. I don't know how we got an all-star cast, but that will be tomorrow's show. A look behind the scenes on the technology and the conversations that make the Stacking Benjamin Show. But let's not talk about that, man, because today we got George Igo here. We love the million stories videos that teach people so much about money and they're so entertaining. George takes a hundred bucks, goes to a city and uh, we're going to talk to him a little bit about Dallas, Houston, New Orleans, New York, Boston, a few others. And we're also kicking this off with, with some pretty wild headlines. We got a TikTok lined up. All right, big show on tap. Let's get the party started. Hello, darlings. And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins Headlines. Let's begin our eight weeks with the new segment, OG, that we call Stuff That Happened While We Were Away. You take a week off, you expect the universe to wait for you, and apparently it doesn't. What's that all about? I thought our new segment was going to be called Dancing Time. Everybody's got to just pause the world for just a second. So let's start off with this one. Did you see the news about AOL and Yahoo? Bye-bye. 
Both? All? Neither? I mean, both of them being set free by Verizon. Verizon, uh, this is according to uh, Morning Brew. Verizon set what seems to be its final away message in its media industry ambitions, announcing a deal to sell AOL and Yahoo for $5 billion to Apollo Global Management. The private equity giant recently spotlight after Leon Black stepped down as chairman in March. It wasn't a good investment for Verizon, which bought AOL for $4.4 billion in 2015, Yahoo for $4.5 billion. So $9 billion bought both of these companies and sold them for five. That's not some good math. This was like when all the telecom companies were just buying whatever because they had all the cash and nothing worked out. Is there a lesson here for individuals in, in your wallet? Like when you got a bunch of cash and you decide to just go on a buying spree, you know, jump on your Robin Hood account. Oh, there's a new thing from Robin Hood we could talk about. There's always a new thing from Robin Hood. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. This is the keeping up with the Joneses thing. This is Verizon going. Yeah, we heard AT and T just bought Directv, so I, I I don't know. We got to what, what should we buy? We got to buy something. Let's buy uh... guys like Hey, uh, Bill, I got all these discs out in the back of my car that go with my old AOL account. Right, you yeah. got mail. Remember those days? Let's do that. Oh, of course I do. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lesson, even though you've got more money, might still need to be careful with it. Second, uh, a couple OG that uh, we can just call them by their first names. In the news, Bill and Melinda, how about that news? You don't really want to know what I think about this. Why? They got done microchipping everybody, and now they, they can split up and conquer the world separately? Yeah, exactly. Uh, the headline I've got here from Recode, Bill and Melinda Gates' divorce could rock the world to charity. Bill and Melinda Gates, leaders of the world's most venerated and powerful philanthropy, said last Monday that getting a divorce an earthquake moment in the nonprofit sector. I'm a, I could just imagine if I'm in a nonprofit right now that's supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and going, oh man, although they say they're going to continue to work together. Yeah, they're going to work together. All right. I don't get it. Divorces often begin amicably. They rarely end amicably. Somebody out there going through a divorce right now, financial planning concerns, OG, things you should do to take care of yourself. I think the biggest thing is, is that people are often too nice. What I mean by that is they go, you know, let's say that you're entitled to something, right? You're entitled to, you know, some calculation of your spouse's pension accumulation, or, you know, you're trying to figure out the house and 401k issue, you know, or whatever. And you just go, yeah, you know what? It's fine. It's fine. I don't care. Uh, Yeah, you need to care. And actually, you probably need to have somebody else care for you because, you know, we talk about the idea that um, emotional decisions and money decisions together very rarely work out correctly. And this is, what is it, the top three most stressful things or something in your life if you get if you get a divorce or something. So, so now you're taking that really stressful thing and then you're adding all your money decisions to it. And oh, by the way, there's no oopsies on the back end, very rarely, right? You can't go back to the judge or the magistrate or whatever and say like, you know, I changed my mind. I really don't want to give her half my pension. I really don't want to give him the house. Like once it's done, it's generally done. And you figure out that you screw something up five, 10 years down the line. So don't be so nice. That's why I think you need to freeze everything. I think a couple needs to freeze everything. I've heard so many stories about one person in the couple goes, Hey, half of what I spent on this credit card is going to go to the person I really don't like right now. So, I mean, how many times I, I may have worked with five or six couples during my career where one person just ran up the credit cards after they filed for divorce. I haven't heard of that happening, but I could totally see that being the case. I see it more like just getting tired of dealing with it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like you're, you're obviously at a point in your life where you're tired of something, right? <laughs> like either someone's tired of you or you're tired of something and you just want this all to be done. So rather than doing it the legal way or doing it out the professional way, I should say, a lot of times people just opt for the like, I'm just going to do the quick thing. And you do the quick thing, and then you find out five years later that the quick thing wasn't as good. I've, I've got a family member who separated from his spouse, and like is it the case in so many times, like one person keeps the house and one person doesn't, right? Like that's the easy solution. Well, also in that deal, the person who kept the house got their equity portion of the house. 
So not only did they get to keep the house, but then they also got like cash for their their portion. Okay, that's a little funky, but maybe it worked out on the back end. Also, that person got to have the bills paid for by the other person of the house for life. And so now right. this is all kind of transpired. And so so now here we are, literally 25 years later. The ex is living in the house. The person who who has to provide for the house is still owning the house, but can't refinance it, is paying an 8.5% mortgage, can't refinance it because... They don't live there. Worse, the ex won't sign off on it because the ex has a <laughs> life estate and says, oh, if I sign off on this to refinance it, you're going to kick me out. And the person who's paying is like, no, I won't do that. Why, if I was going to try to screw with this, I would have done it 20 years ago. Like, no, I don't trust you. So now I'm getting stuck with this 8.5% mortgage on a house that I have to pay for. <laughs> it's just, you know, and it was it was born out of like, I just want it to go away. Yeah, I also think that uh, taking uh, snapshots of where all the money is across the board, OG, where everything is at the time that it happens, make sure the date is legible, it's on there, and um, record everything possible. Well, this is where your family meeting comes in, right? So there's no surprises along the way. If you're the person in the relationship that doesn't have the money brain, let's say you're like, oh, my spouse handles all this. You still have to have a cursory understanding of where all the bodies are buried. And then this would help you. Man, speaking of bodies being buried, our final thing that happened, we, well, there was so much happened when we were away. But uh, how about Dogecoin? Is that, can, I, can I just say that word? Dogecoin last Tuesday jumped 26% to an all-time high of uh, close to 50 cents. By the time the week ended, who knows? We have to record this a little early because we have five days worth of shows, but Oakland Athletics baseball team started accepting Dogecoin for tickets. eToro spurred this by adding the cryptocurrency for its 20 million global users. 26% a single day. Yeah, I mean, if you're not getting 40% a day on your crypto, uh, is it even worth it at this point? <laughs> if you're if you're stuck in the boring stocks, uh, uh, I saw I saw in our Facebook group uh, somebody very excited about uh, cryptos and a bunch of the non cryptos we will call them going back and forth. And I always wonder why the crypto lovers want to proselytize so much for them, maybe to make it go up even faster. Hey, get in. Because uh, I need mine to go up faster. But it, it kind of starts feeling a little like CrossFit. Greater <laughs> CrossFit. <laughs> like, Dogecoin is the... Is, I don't even know how to say it, but it's the CrossFit of crypto. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying crypto and crypto lovers in general. It's like they're the people that do CrossFit. Like, how do you know when somebody does CrossFit? Just ask them, right? <laughs> they'll tell you. The talk about CrossFit. Yes. And uh, not knocking CrossFit. I... I like CrossFit, but man, people that do CrossFit love CrossFit. So, like, Pel- uh, like people who Peloton? People that Peloton, absolutely. And vegans, right? So there it is. Things that happened while we or were away. Maybe we shouldn't have taken a break. Of course, we got to go from that right into our TikTok Minute. Every Monday, we, do, we take a look at uh, some TikToker giving great advice. Great, uh, my tongue firmly planted in my cheek. Maybe a little sarcasm there. On TikTok, and uh, this is this is a TikToker who we talked about a couple weeks ago. We profiled him once. He is back. He's the first returning guest star on this show in our TikTok minute. I think he knows. I, I, uh, a few weeks ago, he apologized to his followers because he got sucked into a coin called Mando Coin, not realizing that a coin named after a Star Wars character might be a fraud, right? Uh, well, here, here is uh, the latest from this, uh, this gentleman. So if you don't know already, what happened was the three developers that reached out to me, they pulled their funds. So they had a percentage of the dev wallet, like 15, 20%, I don't remember. I'm going to be providing evidence of everything, showing their wallets, their their names, exactly who they are. They they, unless they it was fake IDs, which I doubt, because um, they were legitimate. It matches up with everything. I'm going to be providing everything to show who these guys were. What happened was they reached out to me, got me a part of the team. My job was marketing, and 
kind of being the image of this, to provide credibility. Now I'm seeing they used me. To provide credibility. Uh, you would hope this is Mando that he's talking about. Oh, no, 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 no. This is another crypto ripoff. This is Strite OG. Uh, I've got a question. At, at what point does this go from being somebody else's problem to now you've led your followers astray twice? And it might be oh, that we need to- this is the second time. Yeah, we may we may need to not follow this dude anymore. Like if I'm following him on TikTok, I'm like, ooh, Mando coin. He says it's good. Oh, it was a scam. Oh, Strite, this one's good. Uh, <laughs> if you're following some kid on TikTok for crypto advice, I mean, I don't know. You get what you pay for? Yeah. Maybe. And our third headline, and actually a uh, very serious headline, this one was all over the place, also happened uh, last week. This comes to us from Bloomberg Wealth and is written by Tom Schoenberg. At 93, she waged war on J.P. Morgan and her own grandsons. Beverly Schottenstein was 93 years old when she decided to go to war with the biggest bank in the U.S., they have a very flowerful, flowery opening statement, but the piece opens OG with, with her studying an independent review of her accounts as family and lawyers gathered around a table and listened in by phone. The document confirmed her worst fears. Her two financial advisors at JP Morgan Chase and company who oversaw more than $80 million for her had run up big commissions, putting her money in risky investments. They weren't telling about it It was the latest red flag about the bankers. It was actually a family member that found it, but I like what they did here first. The first thing they did, they took it to an outside source and paid them a fee to take a look at these investments and give an outside third party opinion on what was going on. And then she got her A team around her to decide exactly what to do once she heard, heard all the facts. I like that better than some of the, <clears throat> he said, she said stuff you'll find goes on between advisors, brokers, lawyers, et cetera. Do you think the, uh, that meeting was really long or do you think the, the attorney team or whatever was just like, man, with $80 million in investments, it had to be long and then followed by, <laughs> followed by the prices, right? Horde. I mean, it had to be. In fact, here, I know it was a little long because they said some people on the call, some relatives urged her not to make waves. And she said, no, what the money managers did was wrong. They needed to pay, even though, did I say this earlier? Her brokers were her two grandsons. So she now is going to go after her grandsons. So I like that. Number one, she, she gets going in, after the grandkids. Yeah. Go after the grand. It's always the grandkids fault. Just throw them under the bus. Come on. I'm 93. What the hell am I going to do? No, the, uh, uh, I like the fact that she had a, an independent audit of her stuff. But then second thing that happened here, this case begins. She goes after JP Morgan, who she said should have had better oversight of her grandsons. We can okay. talk about oversight and how that happens. OG, but guess what? One of the first thing JP Morgan did was fired the grandkids. JP Morgan in a statement said, these advisors are no longer with the firm and their actions do not represent our values as a company, said Veronica Navarro, a big spokeswoman. Rule, rule number one, if we don't have the oversight we should have had and we get sued, the first thing we do is jettison you. Like I, I remember somebody at a meeting I was at telling me, saying, hey, you know this big company you're with and you got all of this compliance stuff going on? It isn't really to protect you. Your company will tell you it's to protect you as the advisor. It's not to protect you. It's to protect them from you. Yeah. So the very first thing JP Morgan did was distance himself. Now, in JP Morgan's defense, by the way, they did pay the attorney fees, uh, all the FINRA fines as well uh, for the brokers, according to this piece. And I think the funky thing out of all of it is, um, or what's unique about this is she actually made money. Yeah. Yeah. She made the lawyer for the the grandson said she made $30 million dollars during these trades. However, the brokers made, uh, I believe the number was $3.8 million in commissions. So my question is she made 30 million and all of us listening to this go, well, you know, that's an insane amount of money, which it is. Should she have made, like, what did they compare it to? You know, did they compare it to, you know, Hey, if you just thrown it in a mutual fund, you'd have made a hundred million. 
or did she do better? Because the thing that I'm thinking about is, is she just mad because she doesn't get it? You know, is she just mad because her grandkids got paid three million? Like, here's my point. Did the market take a crap? She had 80 million. She had 50 million dollars. The market goes down a whole bunch. If she had just done whatever she was doing, she'd have like 60 million. But instead, her grandkids make her an extra 20. And they're like, hey, look, we're awesome. We made you 30 million. And grandma gets ticked off because, yeah, but you shouldn't have made 3 million. It's like, but I made you 30. (laughs) You know, I mean, I get that it's a huge percentage. Or is it the other side of that where it's like if they would have done nothing and just done the normal the normal stuff you're supposed to do with money, did she lose out on a whole bunch of money? Because they're focusing on the 30 million she made. But I wonder, could she have made more? And is that their argument? There are so many arguments in this piece. One of the things that apparently triggered this was when she was amending her will that she put a curious accusation, it says, about a safety deposit box. She wrote that Evan or Bobby, who had a key to the box as the brokers, had removed about $1 million in jewelry, gifts from her late husband, including her seven-carat diamond engagement ring in 2016, and the jewelry was still missing, she wrote. So she thinks that these, uh, these guys stole from her originally, and then it got worse from there. Hmm. It still ends up being a he said, she said thing. Even though you said that they've got the, the 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 team around it, I mean, there's so many things though here, dude. A FedEx package arrived with materials about a venture capital fund the bank said Beverly invested in. The materials described a Cayman Islands based fund. Another granddaughter who was visiting Alexis Schottenstein was alarmed to discover that her not a Janarian grandmother had apparently committed five million dollars to a Cayman Islands venture capital scheme locked in by the way for many years and by the way i i do get one thing which is that if she has enough money liquid for her to live on this is what we would sometimes call estate money right so you're basing it on the estate of the people they're going to use it not her right so if she's not going to spend it sometimes these aggressive investments i'd see people in their 80s and 90s make these investments however the fact that grandma freaked out when granddaughter said What's this Cayman Islands thing? No idea. And at the same time, she thinks her kids have stolen her jewelry from her safety deposit box. Right. Not a lot of trust there, OG. Time to bring the, the hammer down. You're getting cut out of the well, and I'm going to sue you. Well, and I do like the fact that she went to a independent third party sure. and had somebody else go through it before she dropped the hammer. Yeah. Well, and I think the other thing that you mentioned here is really important is that once you get past the amount of money you need for your lifetime, you can stop investing for your time horizon. You know, you can look at it from the perspective of the time horizon for your kids or grandkids or the time horizon for the charity or whatever. And in fact, be more aggressive, maybe not Cayman Islands venture capital aggressive. That's (laughs) maybe not. Holy cow. uh, That's. That's an interesting one, but from a regular boring stock bond allocation, right? You know, you can be more aggressive because the time horizon for that investment has changed. In just a moment, OG and I will have our takeaways from uh, today's headlines. So many things happened while we were gone. That was a wild ride there for the last several minutes. But before we do that, Navy Federal Credit Unions made it their mission to help their military members over 85 years. You may know, OG, that uh, it is... Military Appreciation Month, my friend. Which every month should be. Our friends from Navy Federal, by the way, sent me this lovely book, A Thousand and One Things to Love About Military Life. Oh, nice. Thanks to them. And uh, let's open to one of these. Getting letters from Santa, care of Elmendorf Air Force Base, Alaska. (laughs) How cool is that? Santa just takes his letters back to the kids, delivers them to the Air Force Base, And then from there, they move on. During Military Appreciation Month, Navy Federal wants to celebrate the commitment that connects them to their military members. You know, many of their employees are military family members, reservists, or veterans themselves. Tomorrow, we're going to talk to uh, retired Colonel Clay Stackhouse a little bit about Navy Federal while we talk about credit unions on the show. Excuse me, that's not tomorrow. That is Wednesday. Get my days mixed up. They offer resources on the site like best cities after service, best careers after service to help veterans transition. It's a difficult time, as you know, OG, for a lot of military people that transition over to civilian life. 
They have 24 seven customer service and support. So they're here for you whenever you need them. Navy Federals help members of my family and they certainly can help you too. visit navyfederal.org forward slash celebrate to check out all the member exclusive offerings during military appreciation months or to share your own shout out. If you're going to do a military shout out, use hashtag mission military. Thanks. Navy Federal Credit Union insured by NCUA. All right, OG, your biggest takeaway from that big pile of, uh, of headlines today. Make yourself available to date Bill or Melinda, whatever it takes. Oh, geez. Like, Hey honey, uh, listen, uh, I got to fly to Seattle today. Uh, sue your grandkids <laughs> and, uh, and Dogecoin. Yeah. Follow it to the moon. It's up another 40% this morning because obviously. Yeah. Cause cha, why wouldn't it be? Cause 39 is not high enough. And I think very seriously, my my biggest takeaway is lock everything down. Make sure you know exactly where the money is at the time divorce proceedings begin. Because at this point, if somebody decides to run up the credit cards, take money out of some accounts, it's going to be difficult to prove it's that no it happened bueno. after, yeah, instead of before. Our guest today, George Igo, is a gentleman who has done a ton of fun things, but the most fun is that he will see how much traveling he can do on as little money as possible. As we gear up to start traveling again, we thought it's a perfect time to talk to this gentleman. And by the way, he's part of Million Stories. And if you're not familiar with the Million Stories, it's videos created by the Singleton Foundation with a mission of financial literacy. And you'll see not just George there, but also Richard Sherman, Glozell. Heck, you'll even see our friend Gene Chatsky nice. on Million Stories. So let's find out how to find more with less from George Igo. And here he comes walking down the stairs. I'm sure his next video is going to be all about spending $100 in Texarkana, which by the way, goes a long way. George Igo <laughs> is here with us. How are you, man? I'm very good. How are you? Good. When you did your Dallas and Houston runs, by the way, when you did videos there, did you come through our town? Did you come through Texarkana? I did not make it to Texarkana, unfortunately. I'll, uh, I'll have to add that to the list, though. Season two. Season two. We need, <laughs> we need cities for season two. Texarkana is up there. That, I'm sure. Right at the top of the list. So the premise of the show, you've got a hundred bucks and you're trying to see as much of a city as possible. Where did that idea first come from? I think it came from my personal life. I've always loved to travel, uh, but haven't always had the bankroll for it. And so I just kind of had to get creative and uh, try to find things that were undervalued and have a good time without breaking the bank. Uh, I've worked in TV for many years. And so at a certain point, it just kind of made sense to combine these two aspects of my life and make a show like this. Is that why the camera came along with you? Did the camera come along with you from the beginning? Has it always been with you then? I started traveling just on my own, just because uh, I wanted to. Then the camera was added two, three years into my real traveling obsession uh, when I started making videos about it. I was wondering this too, behind the scenes as I'm watching you having a blast and just watching the camera work. Is it just you traveling? Do you, do you have a tripod? Do you have somebody with you who's holding the camera sometimes? Like when you're riding the bull in Dallas or, or, <laughs> or doing some of the crazy things you do? Primarily, it's me just holding the camera. I just hold it at arm's length. I got nice long arms. I can just hold it out in front of me and uh, get a good shot that way. I have a, a suction cup tripod that I can attach it to like windows or if there's a tile building, oh. I can attach it right on the street. That thing is, it's like 20 bucks. It's worth its weight in gold. But I do have a field producer that I travel with me. She is the cameraman for me when I need it. But uh, mostly we need a lot of releases. We need there's some paperwork. Uh -huh. involves some logistics to making a, a show like this. And that's uh, her primary focus, but she does just cameraman on occasion, which is very helpful to me. Let's talk first about just behind the scenes of going out to these cities. How much planning goes into making this look like you're just screwing around, <laughs> running around town, <laughs> finding these things. 
Tell me about the lead up to making a season. Well, there is a lot of planning involved. That's one of the things that I am a big proponent of is doing research before you travel so that you can find those undervalued things and not end up at tourist trap type places that charge you $23 for a cheeseburger. But also, you know, doing a show like this, like I said, we need to get permission to shoot at places. And so you do need to reach out beforehand. There are logistical aspects to making a show that other travelers don't need to to deal with. Is it like three um, months then, six months? Oh, no, it's a few weeks. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, two, three weeks. And that's just to make sure, because a lot of places say no to us and they don't want to be involved. More places than you might think say no. Why is and it? So, wait, wait, wait a minute, why is that? That's Because that seems weird to me. People, they just kind of don't want to be involved. They don't want to deal with it or they don't understand what I'm doing necessarily. Uh, this was a, the first season of the show we're doing, so there weren't necessarily examples that we could point people to. Uh, I have my personal YouTube channel that we could direct them to, but it wasn't the show we were doing. And so some people just say, you know what, I, I'd rather not roll the dice on this one. And they just say, no, it's the minority, but it, it does happen. Some of the stuff you do, obviously, is just specifically because you're making your channel, but other stuff is stuff I think that our listeners can probably learn from, and especially even from your travel, George, before the show, uh, sites like TripAdvisor, Yelp, like how much do those factor into your planning or do you have other better places people should go when they dive into a city? Well, I think TripAdvisor is a fantastic resource. Another one is Atlas Obscura. Are you familiar with that one? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, it catalogs more oddities, more weird things in a city. But with all these resources or just, you know, Google searches, go past the first page of results. Go deeper than just, you know, the top 10, 20. Go into the top 100 things in a city and try to dig deeper because that's where you're going to find some more interesting off the beaten path things. If you stay to that first page of Google results, you'll just find the kind of touristy things, often more expensive things and you know, some touristy things are great. I don't want to discount them, sure. but um, you, you do want to dig deeper as well. I feel like in a lot of cases, you get a better heartbeat for the city because you're seeing some of the things that the locals see every day that tourists often miss. Agree completely. Or, I mean, the best things I hear about my show is when people say, oh, I've lived in this city for 10 years and I've never heard of any of this stuff. And I'm like, yes, that, that means I hit my mark. Yeah, I'm surprising <laughs> even the locals. Mission accomplished. I found that we moved away from Detroit, Michigan, just over a decade ago. And when we went back and lived there for two years recently, George, it was the same thing. Coming back to a city, I felt like I wanted to know it now. And I went and saw all this stuff that having lived there forever before, I never did in just a fantastic way. I mean, to your point, a staycation could be a boatload of fun. It really can. I mean, I've done uh, videos on my personal, I live in LA. I've done videos about Los Angeles in my, on my personal YouTube channel. And in my research, I'm like, what? I've never heard of any of this stuff. And it was just so cool. And it's, yeah, staycation, no flights, no hotels, still all the fun. I want to ask you a little bit about your travel because I think people think that because you're looking at life with $100 or less, that you then just frugal everything, you sit and coach. But you told our team that you've traveled to more than 30 countries and you go first class every time you travel. Uh, I, I'm a big uh, credit card points and uh, frequent flyer miles guy. That's not something that we touch on in George Goes Everywhere. But in my personal life, yeah, I've gotten really into it. And so, yeah, I've traveled uh, in first class all around the world to every every inhabited continent. Uh, you know, showered on a plane, uh, eating caviar and surf and turf. And, now you're and showing off. Suite. Wait, now you're just yeah. showing off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I'm six foot five, and so the idea of traveling 15 hours in a coach seat is uh, real tough for me. And so I got into it just to get into a seat that I could fit into. But uh, once you get into it, you realize there's a whole different level of of <laughs> travel class out there. There's got to be some point accumulation tips that you'd have for the stackers listening to the show. What do you do? Do you look for bonus points? Do you try to stack rewards on rewards? How do you accumulate faster? Well, I mean, the big thing is getting the sign up bonuses on credit cards. Those are really how you get 50,000 per card. And just, I, 
I go months at a time without spending cash. I put everything on credit cards and I pay it off every month. I mean, that's one thing with credit cards. I mean, you got to do it responsibly because you can burn yourself if you don't. And so pay it off every month, especially these these travel rewards cards. They have high interest rates. I'm not the first person to say this. Don't spend money you don't have, but uh, don't fall into the traps that credit cards can uh, be. But um, if you are responsible with it and put the time in, you can unlock some real great rewards. You seem to, between watching your videos and obviously spending very little money there to the conversation we're having now about paying off credit cards every month, you just seem to have the financial thing down, George. Did your family talk about money? Were you help with money when you were a kid or was it something you learned like I did from the school hard knocks? Um, well, my father is a CPA, okay. so <laughs> There, there is that. <laughs> um, yes. Maybe, uh, yeah, come by it a little bit naturally. Spreadsheets um, are not foreign in your family. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I learned Excel at a young age. So, yeah, but I mean, it was, I think, talked about and just, you know, was a part of life. But um, I, I don't think it was really drilled into me uh, at a young age. I, I kind of learned all about credit cards kind of on my own, just out of a uh, desire to travel and, and use desire to travel for free in first class. Yeah. Right. Well, start with the end of mine. And by the way, I didn't think there was that, it was that big a deal. I went until a few years ago, I would always walk by first class and I'm like, yeah, I don't need any of that. And then we did it one time. <laughs> now you're hooked. Now you don't want to go back with the little people. You can't go back. You can't go backwards. That's no, <laughs> you totally don't. I want to get into some of the adventures that you had. And uh, as a way into that, let's listen to a piece of the trailer from the show. This is George Goes Everywhere. My name is George Igo, and throughout my entire life, my travel ambitions have always outweighed my bank account. But with some research, planning, and a little creativity, I find the best things to do in a city, all without spending more than $100. Let's have some fun. Whoa, look at that. Meter's going crazy. I got a ghost around me. People are walking past laughing at me. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hit me yeah, face. Shot. Sorry. Say face. Yeah. Face. I want to I ask you about those three things in particular, because people could only hear what was going on. They didn't see it. First of all, it looks like, are you on, are you on a ghost tour somewhere? That is a uh, ghost tour in Savannah, Georgia. Yes. Oh, what a, I would guess there's not that many better places in the United States to go on a ghost tour than Savannah. I've been on the one in Charleston, which you also went to Charleston, but never been to the one in Savannah. Uh, there's a ton of ghost tours in that, in that uh, city. It's a great city for it. And what's cool about that, they gave you a little, uh, yeah, I think it was the EMF meter which I'm not entirely electromagnetic frequency something. I don't know exactly what it stands for. I don't know what it stood for, but I liked it. And it supposedly measured when there was a ghost around you. I, I have no idea how accurate that is, but you know, I, I leaned into the, the experience and, and had fun with it. Did you find yourself afraid ever? No, I, I was not terribly yeah. afraid. I enjoyed it. So that uh, was fun. How much did, do you remember how much you paid for that? Off the top of my head, I don't. It was probably in the... I want to say it was in the 30s yeah. somewhere. It's said in the show, we have on-screen graphics that say what everything costs. I don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, exactly but, what but it costs, general so. recollection, and I shouldn't have given you the gotcha on that one because I can't imagine remembering all these prices. Yeah. But just your, your general feeling though, was it worth it? Was it worth the 30 bucks? Oh yeah, yeah, I think so. It was um, just a great way. Like even if the ghost tour, but also you just, you walk around the city. It's almost, it's a tour of the city essentially too. You know, not just about ghosts. You also see different parts of the city that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. And uh, it was at night, and uh, the the um, tour operator was a guy who was really passionate about it, uh, a local, someone who was into it. And I always enjoy meeting people like that, locals who are are passionate about the city and and the location. And so, yeah, I think it was definitely worth it. We have a ghost tour in our town in Texarkana. But it only operates, you know, around Halloween and the kid that was our ghost tour, and I shouldn't make fun of him because, you know, these people do as well as they can, but it's so typical of a small town trying to do a big town thing. The kid's halfway through the tour. And to your point, George, I'm learning all this stuff about the town and, and the history of the town. And it's fascinating. But halfway through the tour, he goes, well, I don't want to scare you. 
And I thought, I'm on a damn ghost tour. You're supposed to scare me. Like, what the hell are you talking to? I don't want to scare you. What's that about? So, so That's there, the point. That's a selling point. I know. Scare me, man. Uh, that one wasn't so great. It was it was great history. And um, there was one other ghost tour that I didn't love. But in Boston, in Charleston, love to do the one Savannah. Those historical towns seem like they're made. You can, even during the daytime, man, in Savannah, as I'm following you around, George, you can feel the ghosts. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, what they say, one of the most haunted city in America is, is what they like to say. Yeah, I believe it. So the second thing, you're eating something outside. And you're clearly mm-hmm. having trouble with it. What What are you eating, and yes. why are people laughing at you? Uh, that is Nashville hot chicken in in Nashville. Uh, that uh, Bolton's in Nashville. I'm not a huge spicy food guy. I, I maybe a little, but I'm usually get the mild when I when I go places. And I did get the mild, and it was still just pretty painful for me. And I was sitting outside, and yeah, people were walking in, and they saw me suffering, and they were they were chuckling at my expense. <laughs> You also in Dallas, you got to explain this thing that you ate. You ate, I got to look this up, a funnel cake bacon queso burger, I think it was. That's right. Yeah. It's uh, basically a a bacon cheeseburger with funnel cake instead of a bun. (laughs) It won uh, an award at the Texas State Fair a couple years ago, and I was able to go to a a place that actually served it. And he, he claimed he invented it. And that it wasn't the Texas State Fair that where it came from. And so a little, little bit of drama there. But uh, yeah, it's just, you know, Texas State Fair is known for its kind of ridiculous food concoctions. And so I had to try it. You find in all the cities you go to, one of the big things you do is you go find these eats and these eats that really don't cost a lot of money. I think watching George Goes Everywhere, I mean, a good lesson is you don't have to pay a lot to eat well if you just hunt. Absolutely. I, I think there's a great example in the uh, New York City episode. I don't know if you saw that one. I went to a place called Enoteca Maria in Staten Island, and they have something called Nanas of the World, where every day a different grandmother of a different nationality works the kitchen. And so one day it's a Puerto Rican grandmother, the next day it's Italian, next day it's Indian, next day it's Greek, so on. I think that's such a fun concept. And I was there, it was a Peruvian woman named Rosa who's working the kitchen. Her food was amazing, and it's just such an interesting idea. And if you Google great restaurants in New York, you might find, you know, Peter Luger's Steakhouse in Brooklyn, which famous restaurant. I'm sure it's fantastic. I don't think I'm getting out of there for under 100 bucks. You can't go. But, you know, you dig a little deeper, you find this place that's, you know, the food is also amazing. It's a great, fun concept, and it doesn't break the bank. But, you know, you only find it if you dig a little deeper. Yeah, that was, it was so great. I was wondering if after the funnel cake bacon queso burger to get it right that I was wondering if you just went and got your angioplasty like right right away. I I was moving a little slow after that. I'll, (laughs) I'll give you, I'll give you that. Maybe I wasn't, wasn't sprinting down the street after that one. They were telling you you weren't going to finish it. They were giving me the business. Yeah. They were giving me a hard time about it. And you got to, I ate it wrong. You're supposed to, he says you're supposed to take the top funnel cake bun for lack of a better word off and eat that then go at it like a tostada but it was a little unwieldy but i i got there that's how they know you're a tourist in dallas that's, yeah, that's yeah. how they know. uh it's i want to uh, no. talk about so this summer for the first time i went in a corn maze i was in vermont and the one you went in was 10 bucks and you're going through it and and i'm wondering i had a good time but it's still just, you're out in a field of corn and it's 10 bucks. Like you could just go walk out in a field of corn. Did it feel, was the corn maze worth 10 bucks? Yeah, I think so. It's not just a field of corn. I mean, it is, there are paths and it is a proper maze. I think it's fun. I enjoy stuff like that. Even if it is a little silly, I kind of lean into silly stuff and just embrace it personally. But even if you're not into that, it's a beautiful location. It's out in nature. It's out fresh air, even if you're not into the maze specifically, I think it's nice to get out into the, uh, you know, on this kind of farmland area. And I I still think it's worth it. I got to tell you, Cheryl, my spouse had to talk me into it and I loved it. I thought (laughs) I would totally do it again. And we spent, I don't know, 30, 45 minutes trying to get the hell out of it. There was one point I had no idea where we were. And you actually, I mean, I don't want to spoil people got to watch the series, but you didn't quite make it. 
I didn't quite make it. I've made it out in a way, but not in the way they meant me to. Uh, <laughs> I want to I want to ask you last about another concept from Boston which we have a lot of fans of small houses, right? Of tiny houses in Boston, you find this thing called a spite house. Tell everybody what a spite house is. Cause this might've been the precursor to the tiny house movement. <laughs> uh, well, a spite house, there's only a handful of them in the entire country, but two of them are in Boston and they are houses, tiny houses built on tiny lots of land. that were built out of spite for someone else. So like if a developer moved in and was building some big apartment building, uh, but they didn't have all the land, someone might say, well, you know, uh, I'm going to build a house on this tiny six by 10 lot of land just to spite you, just because I don't like you. And there are two of them in Boston. And uh, they're, I think, maybe like six feet wide each. I just think they're funny. And um, I just enjoy when people just go so far and just take a concept to its absolute limit. Even if their motivation is spite, I still think it's pretty hilarious. Now, there was a tall one that was three or four stories tall, and you've got your wingspan out, which at 6'5", I'm sure is bigger than the average wingspan, George. But still, your hands could have touched both sides of the structure. Basically, yeah, it's, yeah. it is thin. And yeah, that one was yeah three, four stories tall. The small one, was somebody actually living there? I don't believe it was a home. I think it was like an office, office of some sort. Yeah. I didn't really look in. It's a it's a private building, so I didn't really um, look through the windows like or anything like that. Being the creepy uh, yeah. guy gets kicked out <laughs> yeah, of the city. I, I, I don't need to be too creepy. <laughs> Only a little creepy. Um, but uh, I, th I think it was more of a of an office type situation. We talked to uh, Joseph Rosendo from the PBS show Travel Scope, and he was saying that it's not just the things you say; it's the people that you meet that really make the trip. I'm wondering if behind the scenes, if you had any weird interactions with people or fun interactions or things that really made it that maybe got cut that did, weren't able, weren't inside the scope of George Goes Everywhere that you could share. I talk to as many people as I can. I love talking to strangers. Uh, I'm not intimidated by that at all. I always talk to Uber drivers or stuff like that, which also side note, I mean, that's where you can learn about a lot of things in a city. I mean, in a... Uh, the Houston episode, we went to a place called Irma's, a Mexican restaurant that was told to us by our contact at the Space Center Houston. We just asked him, do you know of any uh, good restaurants? And he's like, oh, have you heard of Irma's? It's this Mexican place where Irma, there's no menu. It's just what Irma feels like cooking that day. And I feel, I said, that's, that's wonderful. Okay, we got to check out Irma. And so we went over there and we're like, hey, can we shoot this segment here? And he said, yeah, sure. And it was great. Some things got cut. There was a uh, a uh, woman in Nashville who uh, her side hustle is giving hula hoop lessons. And so I took uh, hula hoop lessons in a, in a public park in Nashville. She's been doing it for years and I'm, I'm not good at hula hooping. I did learn that. <laughs> I wonder if you cut that to just save some dignity, if that might've been, because if I had myself hula hooping, that would not be good video. I'm, I'm always happy to be the butt of a joke. I don't <laughs> mind that at all. So I, I'm, I'm fine. I, I don't get embarrassed by putting stuff on on camera. But I think we just felt it didn't necessarily have anything to do with Nashville. It, it could be something that exists in any city anywhere. Sure. And so it didn't really fit who, in in that regard. Who doesn't like a good hula hooping from now, you know, every once in a while, no matter where you are. Yeah. We we all share <laughs> we all share that. I forgot to ask you about the last thing that we heard. We heard you getting hit in the face. What people didn't see was that it looks like you're in some LARP with live action role playing thing with foam swords and stuff. Where's tell me about that experience. That's exactly it. That's also in Nashville, a foam fighting league. It's I think every you know Sunday afternoon, there were dozens of people there. There were easily 50 plus people there, all in varying uh, states of costume with foam fighting shields and swords and arrows and full on uh, wow. just foam fighting league. And I, I bought a couple people, the, the gentleman you saw, I was no match for him. He, he really he came at me. He was taking you to town. He really came at me hard and I just, I had no defense and he accidentally hit me in the face. It, it was a foam sword. It didn't hurt, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I was no match for him. Let's talk a minute about the whole series that you're a part of, Million Stories. I think it's so powerful to talk about great ways to use money, about mindful uses of money. 
how did you hook up with a million stories people to get rolling on the project? Uh, I was referred by a friend. I used to, as I mentioned, I've worked in TV for many years. I was a writer on the show, Mike and Molly a few years ago. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Yeah. And one of the other writers there uh, knew someone over at million stories and they asked him like, Hey, do you know anyone who, you know, maybe a, a younger millennial type who, who makes videos? And he's like, as a matter of fact, I do. And, uh, he referred me to them and we kind of hit it off right away. And uh, I'd already made some content on my YouTube channel that kind of fit what they were trying to do some based on budget travel. And uh, so it went quickly from there. And I know it isn't just the videos though. People, when they go, they also get some help with their money. Talk about that. Yeah. Well uh, the whole goal of million stories is to kind of break the taboo of talking about money. It's something that people are often a little cagey about and they don't want to talk about it. We're trying to break that taboo get people talking about it, thinking about it, and planning ahead for their financial future. So when you go to Million Stories, you can watch George Goes Everywhere. It's you know more entertaining, but then there's a lot more uh, resources there, some stuff that's more educational to help people take control of their financial future. It is so fun. And it's you, Richard Sherman, Glozell, a bunch of bunch of people doing some great work and just, it, and they're so fun. The average video, what is about seven to eight minutes long? I would, uh, the, George goes everywhere. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I would say about that, about seven. So it, it varies a little bit here and there, but yeah, they're kind of bite-sized in that way. Yeah. If you get our guide to the shows, you already have a link to George goes everywhere, but for everybody else, we'll have it in our show notes page at stackybedjamins.com. George, thanks so much for hanging out with us and talking about the making of the show. Congratulations on what is an awesome, awesome. <laughs> I had so much fun watching it traveling, especially now that we can't travel, right? Watching you do all this travel just before COVID. I bet you can't wait to get out, by the way. I, I'm itching, chomping at the bit to get out there again. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for hanging out with us. And if you come through Texarkana, I'll take you around here. And I'm sure that would be the best show ever. Sold. I'm in. Hey, trivia fans, I'm your pal, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today might just be Joe's mom's favorite holiday of all time. Every year, she insists on celebrating National Clean Up Your Room Day from sunup to sundown. 6 a.m. today, hey, Doug, when are you coming over? And then every year at 1230, when I ask about a break, lunch, who needs lunch? I tell you, she'd better get excited when it's National Baking Day next week. Anyway, she's really getting on me for taking a break to do this trivia, so I should probably get back to cleaning out my closet. But anyway, first, today's trivia question. Bono was born on this date back in 1960, and for the youngins out there, he was in a band your mom loves called U2. So here's the question. What country is U2 from? We'll award you some bonus points if you know the city, too. I'll be back with or without you. With or without you. And again, for you youngins out there, that sounded exactly like Bono. So you don't need to go like look it up on iTunes or anything. That was pretty much a spot on imitation. It's Small Business Month stackers and Dell Technologies and Windows are celebrating your unstoppable drive. Save up to 45% on powerful PCs with Windows 10 Pro to work from anywhere, plus top monitors and docks for the ultimate business setup, all with easy financing options through Dell Financial Services. Speak to a Dell Technologies advisor who can help you find the right business tech, server, storage, and cloud solutions at 877-ASK-DELL. That's 877-ASK-DELL for Small Business Month Savings. Hey, stackers, I just finished scrubbing the baseboards and clearing the cobwebs out of the basement corners and folding the laundry when there was a knock on the door. Wouldn't you know it was that neighborhood kid, Terry, from down the street. He found a sneaker and they were having everybody try it on. Well, because if it was an Air Jordan, whoever it fit, they were going to have go play for the neighborhood team, meaning one of us would get to escape this horrible holiday. Well, of course, Joe pushed to the front, sat down, but his foot was way too thin for this shoe. It just fell right off. Then OG plopped down, and Terry couldn't get his foot in no matter how much he pushed. And then I stepped forward and said, what about me? Well, Joe's mom protested that I had work to do, but 
Terry and the neighborhood kids insisted. So I took off my apron, sat down in the kitchen chair. Terry got down on one knee and put the shoe on. And it totally fit. I am done with National Clean Your Room Day. On one hand, that's great. But on the other hand, I was hoping she'd have me clean the mirrors next because I could totally have seen myself chewing that job. (laughs) Anyway, so I'm off to help the neighborhood team lose another game. But first, let's get you a trivia answer. The question was this. Since Bono was born on this date in 1960 and he was in the band U2, what country was U2 from? If you guessed Ireland, then you'd be right. I also promised bonus points if you knew the city. So if you guessed Dublin, pat yourself on the back doubly hard. Well, no more Sunday bloody Sunday cleaning up around here. I'm out. See ya. Big thanks to George for hanging out with us. I think it's so true what he talks about with food, OG, that... um, You can eat really well for not a lot of money if you find some of these, some of these dives in cities, some of these uh, beat up restaurants that have been around forever. We've got a place here in, in Texarkana that is truly the best hamburger I've ever had. Oh boy. And it's this. Have you ever taken me? It's a hole in the wall right downtown called TLC. Uh, Just a fantastic. I don't think you've ever taken me there. Now we've we've got a Hopkins though, which is also not expensive, but and not quite the best burger ever. <laughs> apparently, the di- might not get the best burger ever treat. The difference is when I'm hanging out with you, we want to have a beer, and you can't get a beer at TLC. No, you when you're hanging out with me, you need a beer. I need a beer. Correct. Yes, you need. Well, a beer. let's not. I don't twelve step program need a beer, but um, but big thanks to George. 100 bucks to see a city. And by the way, watching the video of him falling off the uh, bull at Gillies in Dallas, pretty classic. You ever do the bull riding? Nope. Sure looks like fun. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first, OG. Because we were talking about grandmas earlier. I'm thinking about making molasses cookies this weekend. Because my grandma used to make molasses cookies, and they were really good. So uh, I'm going to say molasses cookies with a little little milk. That's what I'm going to value this weekend. That sounds great. I'm all about it. Uh, You can't even beat that. You're you're like, I'm in. I'm I'm do it. (laughs) Done. (laughs) Sold. It's your loved ones and your time. But heck, why not loved ones' time with over cookies? That's why... They've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. They've streamlined the application. You get an instant coverage decision, affordable prices. Just head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now. You'll get a free quote. You'll see how quickly you can get this done. Today, we're going to throw out the lifeline to our friend, Bill. Say hello, Bill. Hey, this is Bill in Charleston, South Carolina. I've got a question that maybe one of your wives would want to know the answer to. Also, it's kind of scary. If I die before the term is up on my term life and my wife cashes it in, is she going to have to pay taxes on that money? She's just curious. Just uh, waiting for your answer. Thanks. Bye. Hey, Bill, thanks for that question. I think we got to warn Bill that it's kind of scary when your spouse is asking about the life insurance. <laughs> Could potentially how be. How long is this for? That's right. How, mu- how much do I get? No, really, eat your mushrooms. So what's the answer to that one, OG? Uh, the real quick answer is that uh, life insurance proceeds are 100% tax-free. Bam. So she'll get so, all that money. Uh, so, so she gets it all. But but you bring up a really important thing, which I think can be transferred to other things as well. Sometimes the money is not the money. Sometimes the money is not all the money you think it is. We're um, in the process of thinking about selling a rental property that we have and got an attractive offer. So we're, you know, considering it. And, and <laughs> you got to factor in broker commissions and taxes due on the appreciation. You know, and all of a sudden the money's not as much money as you thought it was. And and you look in your IRA balance, you go, I've got a million dollars in my 401k. It's like, yeah, it's not quite a million because you got to pay taxes. 
So I think it's important to recognize that what you see isn't always what you get. Now, life insurance is is 100% tax-free. Uh, there would be some weird circumstances if it was owned by a trust or something that it could get a little squirrely, but you kind of run, run of the mill, old fashioned policy is going to pay the beneficiary tax free. And there you have it, Bill. I don't think I, you're just going to drop the mic now. I don't, oh yeah, I'm sure that's the one to drop the mic on for sure. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Bill. And uh, you might want to start wearing a helmet when you're <laughs> around your spouse. She's asking about the life insurance. I don't know. If you've got a question like Bill had today, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail and uh, OG will be happy to answer your question as well. And because you're brave and called in, we're throwing Bill some Haven Lifeline swag, the greatest money show on earth t-shirt, which is, I think, we got some pretty cool artwork, OG, but that's my my personal favorite. Stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. All right. I think, believe it or not, that's going to do it for today. We got a bunch of people to thank, and I think we'll let Doug handle that. Except for a couple things. Number one, I'd like to thank everybody who's left a review of this show. And this is a, normally I talk about the reviews that mom puts on the refrigerator. But today I want to talk about this review because someone here was nice enough to give us a five-star review. This is a review from Dave. Dave says, great personal financial, five stars. And Dave wrote this, OG, directly to me. He says, the show's great, Joe. I love the content. My only complaint is how you integrate the commercials into the show. Everyone skips the commercials with a 15 to 30 second skip button. When you integrate the commercials, we end up skipping part of the show. It's frustrating. It's cleaner to give us a warning that a commercial is coming up. Then keep it exactly 15 or 30 seconds long. Sorry to complain. Keep up the good work. Love your show. I want to address that for two reasons. Number one is, I've said this before, leaving a review is fantastic. Please leave us reviews. But if you have a comment like that about the show, I'd love to get an email from you and we can talk about it. I don't know who Dave is. If Dave has other questions, I can answer those. Just shoot me an email, joe at stackingbenjamins.com because I'm not even sure if Dave's going to hear this answer. And the answer is, I have seen some great minds in podcasting, and so have you, OG, during the almost a decade that we've been here, that have gone bye-bye. And the reason that they went away was because there was, frankly, no money coming in. And we certainly wouldn't recommend that anybody get into podcasting for the money. In fact, we're in these podcasting forums, and and you and I always laugh when, when somebody When somebody says, hey, I want to start monetizing my podcast and the podcast is like three weeks old, you know, somebody's getting into podcasting for the wrong reason, but advertisers make sure that we can keep bringing in shows. We can employ our six person team here in the basement. We can make a quality show because of the fact that we can pay people to help us make this. And I think part of that has allowed us to be on for almost a decade well, and also remember that, um, <laughs> of course, you know this, the first five and a half years, we didn't have any revenue. Zero. Yeah, th- it was zero. It wasn't until I-, I distinctly remember talking to you about it. Yeah. We got to have some, I'm tired of like, you know, something, man, like something. You know of anybody, $100 a month, something. I can upgrade my microphone. A lot of time. That's a that's a story we may we may share later about one of our early sponsors. But for now, for now, Dave, here's here's the deal. Sponsors are important to the show. I listen to a lot of podcasts. I'm smart enough to know that people skip through them, but if people all skip the advertisers, there are many ways for advertisers to get statistics and see if people are skipping through the ads. And if people are skipping through the ads. We don't get paid as much, which is why we try to make them entertaining when we can. Some ads, we get a straight read. Geico, I'm told exactly what to say. I agree with what I'm saying, but I don't deviate from that script. Discover the same way. But we're talking real money as an example, Masterclass, Canva. A lot of times we're given the ability to make it more entertaining. And for that reason, our goal is actually to try to Make a show that's entertaining enough that you don't that you don't skip through the ads. And I know people are going to do it, and that's fine. But unfortunately, that's 
not going to change. What will change is we won't have Robin Hood show up as a sponsor again. <laughs> I think our friends at Westwood One got that loud and clear from us when that uh, little accident happened a few weeks ago. But great comment. Keep the comments coming. I don't think writing that comment in a review is great because I don't know if Dave's listening to this episode. You know what I mean? Right. Feel free to write me. Joe at stackybedjamins.com. And I have had, I have had, since I said this a few weeks ago, I've had uh, several people write me about the show. And I love talking about the making of the show and why we do things. Anytime I can help people understand the fun of podcasting. But Dave, thanks for that review. Thanks for the five stars. Thanks to everybody else who's left us a review. We've had a lot of great reviews lately. We are very appreciative that you spend time with us. And because of that, we're going to have an awesome week this week, starting with uh, this episode and then our Dell episode, special Dell episode, the Dell Podference episode tomorrow. And another special episode on Thursday. Remember when we did the potpourri episode a few weeks ago, OG, with the, all the stackers who are doing cool stuff, people in our community? We're going to do another one of those on Thursday. Oh, fun. We got three more community members who are doing some inspiring stuff that we're going to shine a spotlight on, along with how credit unions work on Wednesday and, of course, our normal roundtable on Friday. So big eight weeks kicking off today. And last but not least, if you want to make better decisions with your money in 2021 than you've made in uh, 2020 or before, OG and his team are taking on new clients. So to see how his team can best interface with yours, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash OG. And that's a link to their schedule. All right. That's going to do it for today. Doug, what should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our headlines. Marital trouble? Record where your assets are and keep open communication so that nobody is taken advantage of during an already painful process. Second, take a lesson from George from A Million Stories. George goes everywhere. You don't have to go broke when you travel. With a little bit of planning and research, you can have a blast without breaking the bank. But the big lesson... I just reread the name of this holiday and it says National Clean Your Room Day, not National Clean Joe's Mom's House Day. I pointed that fact out to the boss and she said, that's a technicality we can talk about as soon as I take out the garbage. Yeah. Looking forward to that debate, lady. As soon as I get back inside. To learn more about our guests and for more resources, you can head to our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. If you enjoyed hearing from George, then head over to millionstories.com, where their goal is to make becoming great with your money entertaining, easy, and interesting with all kinds of compelling content and learning resources to help you and inspire your entrepreneurial dreams. Start with this season of George Goes Everywhere and then check out the rest. There's enough to fill a money geek's soul. This show is created by Joe Saul Seahide, produced by Richie Rudder Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and if you could only know what it really smells like down here. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor.
Welcome to the after show. If you're new to the show, this is the part of the show that doesn't exist. We usually don't talk about money topics. We often will talk about uh, movies, TV shows. Sometimes we'll talk about board games, playing a mean game of Splendor right now with some friends on Board Game Arena. What I like about Board Game Arena is, A, it's free. You can play games with friends who are in different places. It was great, which has been great the last year. You know, due to COVID. What happens is you take your turn and then you, everybody doesn't have to be sitting there at the same time. You know what I mean? Right. You take your turn and then I'll log on once or twice a day. And uh, you can also get an alert that says, hey, it's your turn. I don't do well with alerts with my ADD. So I leave my alerts off and I just log in a couple times. But playing some Splendor, which is a fine. Have you played Splendor? I do not know what that is. So I'm going to say no. I think you and Mrs. OG would really like that game. Okay. Uh, but I said the, the story about our early sponsor. So I'm walking through the halls at FinCon, which is a big conference for financial media people. Financial nerds. And I'm passing the Fidelity booth. And I know the Fidelity rep who's there. And we had had him on the show talking about something. And I thought, you know what? Fidelity sometimes has some money for bloggers. They'll do some sponsored content of a blog. Maybe I can ask Fidelity Investments if they'll sponsor our show. And by the way, this is when our show was tiny and like now, very homemade, but much more homemade then than than it is now. (laughs) A little more-ish homemade. And I thought that it might help us if we can say Stacking Benjamins is brought to you by Fidelity Investments. Bam! Like our little podcast gets a little credibility from a big name sponsor. And I thought there's no way Fidelity Investments is going to sponsor a show that just has a few hundred listeners. There's just, our show is way too, way too small. Not that we're not grateful for every individual listener, but in the world of podcasting, that's not a big enough audience for somebody like Fidelity. But I thought, you know, he's there. I know the guy I'm going to ask. So I walk up to the booth and I said, Hey, Ben, you guys ever think about sponsoring a podcast? And this is, this is before Fidelity was doing much in podcasting. And I do explain to him how our podcast actually works, how people download it. And he said, he said, well, maybe how much money are you looking for? And I thought to myself, my first thought was this is Fidelity flipping investments. We can back the truck up. <laughs> we can get a big sponsor. But then I thought about the long game, which was what I mentioned earlier. If we just get Fidelity Investments and we can say that, like that's worth way more than money. Way more than money. So I thought, what's the smallest amount of money I can ask this guy for and not get laughed out of the room? And do you remember how much I asked him for, OG? No, I don't actually. I asked him for a hundred bucks. <laughs> Twenty twenty-five dollars a show for a month. Our show was one day a week then. Twenty-five dollars. Twenty-five dollars a week. Sponsor four shows. He goes, a hundred bucks? That's it? And I said, Yeah, that's it. And he's like, Yeah, deal. How about if we do it for three months? <laughs> yes. And I've got that in my wallet. <laughs> Fantastic. So Fidelity Investments was an early sponsor. It's a good news, bad news thing. At the end of three months, they didn't come back. But for three months, our little tiny show got to say, Stacky Benjamins brought to you by Fidelity Investments. You're still, you're still hanging out here? OG, what are they still doing here? Uh... What are who still doing here? They got stuff to do and they're still here. Well, okay. If they're still here, you know, Navy federal credit union made it their mission to help their military members over 85 years. And we're super excited that it's military appreciation month and Navy federal wants to celebrate the commitment that connects them to their military members. You know, I'm going to take another random page from the thousand and one things to love about military life. Entertainment tours made possible by USO and Armed Forces Entertainment. 
when do we get to the point that we get to do some of those? Wouldn't that be fun? And we're like, no, wake up people. This is the interesting part. Many of their employees are military family members, reservists or veterans themselves. And they offer resources like best cities after service and best careers after service to help veterans transition to civilian life. In fact, when you go dive into the menus, what you'll find is they make it really easy to find exactly the things that you want. My nephew, Colin, looking at uh, getting a car, went into the menus, young person in the Navy, needs a car, wants to know how car loans work. There it is. All the resources he could ask for to help him. And better yet, they have 24-7 customer service and support, so they're here for you whenever you need them. So visit NavyFederal.org forward slash celebrate to check our member exclusive offers during Military Appreciation Month or share your own shout out with hashtag Mission Military Thanks. Navy Federal Credit Union insured by NCUA.